I had to come over and apologize. And <laughs> I thought if he's big enough to do it, he's big enough to know better. But anyhow, she got over that, and then they got a little older, and Herman and I was there with their cowboy hats. And Devon and Arden liked to get these big hats on and get on broomsticks and ride all around like tough cowboys and sheriffs and things. Well, Olene wasn't an inch behind them because she had to play with them all the time, and she's just about as wild as they were. She could be just as dainty and cute as could be, but she could join in the fun of the boys, too. And uh, they were prancing all over, and she had this big hat on, and Devon got over on the wood pile, and he hollered back, and he said, I'm going to arrest all you kids. I'm the sheriff, and I'm going to arrest you. You know, and he was just a talking this big stuff to him, and... and uh, he said, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and Arden says, let's tell that old sheriff, let's tell that old sheriff, and he couldn't think what to tell that old sheriff. Let's just tell that old sheriff, and all he says, shit in the bush. <laughs> and I nearly died, I heard him. I thought, where on earth had she ever heard such a word as that? It just nearly took me off my feet, and I was telling Night about it. And she says, oh, I know where she heard it. She said, they was getting into mischief the other day, and I said to them, you little shits in the bush. She said that was what her dad used to say all the time. Says he got it from down in the Dixie country, guess, when he's a kid. And he said, any time a kid got him, mad, got him mad, he called him a little shit in the bush. And said she, she, she heard me call my kids that the other day. But that was so funny, it isn't very good to tell, but it happened. <laughs> it looked so funny coming out from her here. She was looking about half sideways out from under that hat on an old broomstick, hollering, let's tell that old Cheryl shit in the bush. <laughs> well, anyhow, they had some pretty good play times. They had some parties together, and they ate lunch. And Oh, Arden had a bad experience one time. They'd had a birthday party drinking pop and things, and then he got into Nida's back room, and she had some fly talks in a bottle and he drank that and we was really scared he just about got to sleep and she had to stay up all night keeping him awake and they got him to try to vomit it up and we didn't know what was going to happen we lived far away from the doctor so we went through quite a bit raising our kids when she wasn't very old i guess six or seven months old she couldn't walk or anything she was sitting on the bed and i was mopping the floor and waxing it and i just let her sit on the bed and, and uh, she never had offered to get off or get close to the edge or anything but i just turned around for a minute and bang i heard a pop and she fell off the bed well i picked her up and she began to scream you know, and she's just as white as a sheet. And, oh, I knew it had killed her. I just looked for her to die. I guess the only thing it did was scared her white because she didn't have any bruises. She didn't have any broken bones or anything. But, oh, that scared me. I never, ever dared to let her sit on the bed anymore after that. I used to kind of sit her up with some pillows, you know, and let her go, uh, you know, just sit. But she'd somehow she'd worked her way to the front of the bed. I don't know if she wasn't too old. But she didn't cut her teeth for a long time. I was telling about her walking, but she didn't cut her teeth for quite a long while. And uh, Herman wrote, see, she was a year old in November, and before that he'd written and he said, if Olene don't get a tooth by Christmas time, I'm tell her I'm, her daddy's going to whittle her out a pair of wooden teeth out here at the herd and bring her home for Christmas. Well, just before Christmas, she cut her first little china chopper. We could hear it with a spoon. And she just grinned when we'd touch it with a spoon, you know, and this was in her mouth. I wished I had her baby book to see some of the things I put down in there. She probably knows them. Maybe I won't tell them the same way twice. If I don't, you'll have to go through and correct this lesson letter or this tape or else you'll have to uh, cross out the things I've told wrong in your baby book. One fourth of July, and she was about three, I guess, and I couldn't go up the street and carry Gail all the way. He must not have been too old, but they wanted all the primary to dress up for something. One of the nursery rhyme children, so I dressed Olene for Mary Had a Little Lamb. And it was the cutest thing. I made her a little outfit red, with a little white puffy sleeve blouse and a little red bodice and a little red, a little black bodice and a little red full skirt. And then I'm, she had a little lamb that was you pull on a string and you know, that little thing walked clear from that house in the lane and pulled that little lamb clear up to the churchyard where they was having the 
parade and she went in the parade with that and she got the prize. She come bringing it down about noon all alone. Said she, they gave me this. I think it was a quarter and she lost it in the lawn grass. We handed it but we couldn't ever find her quarter. She was quite little. I, I used to have her uh, watch Gail. I was there alone, nobody to go to the store in an emergency and when I used to have to go to the store for something in a that I had to have, uh, I'd have to have her watch Gail and she'd sit in the rocking chair and hold him in, just a baby, you know, just a little kid that could sit by her. He was too little to walk or anything, but she'd hold him down if he'd wiggle, she'd hold him all the tighter and the tighter he'd hold him, the harder she'd scream and the harder she'd rock. She could tell you all about this, but she tended him by the hour. And then one time she decided that she loved to clip paper. Oh, how she loved to clip papers. She'd cut up everything, paper doll books and magazines and things and clip. But I taught her that as she clipped, she had to pick up her mess. And so she put it in the wood box, and then I'd use it to start the fire. We had a wood box sitting right by the kitchen stove, and we had to have a fire every morning in the stove, summer and winter. And I was out to the line hanging up Gail's baby clothes or diapers or something. And, and uh, she got all of her stuff gathered up and then she decided to finish the job. She set it on fire. So she, she set the paper in the wood box on fire. And then she got to worry and I guess, and she came to the door and screamed to me, come quick, I set the house on fire. <laughs> and I went in and she'd made a, she got all the paper picked up and then she got a match and struck a fire in the wood box. And then one time, Gail was, she, I think she'd seen me clean the kid, uh, Gail's ears and hers out with Q-tips or something, but she got a bobby pin. Maybe I'd done something with bobby pins too, I don't know. Maybe with some uh, pe uh, cotton around a ba uh, bobby pin sometime when I was out of Q-tips. And she had, uh, got a bobby pin and Gail had been sitting on the floor playing just a little baby you know just a little kid playing with blocks on the floor and she'd put that pin by tried to clean his ear with a bobby pin and he turned and she was using the sharp edge of it and it poked him right in the side of the ear I guess well when I come in she come over just a screaming to me outside mama come quick I picked baby buddy boy's ear I picked baby buddy boy's ear and it's a bleeding. And I run in the house, and here it was just a streaming blood out of that ear, and she picked it with a bobby pin. Well, I didn't know what to do, but there was a nurse in town, and I took him up. I didn't even dare to look. I thought, oh, she's ruptured the drum. He's going to be deaf for the rest of his life. I got her by the hand, and there I went to totten him up to the nurse, and she cleaned it out with some rubbing alcohol and looked down in, and she says, he had turned, you know, and it had hit the side of his ear. It didn't go straight in, and she said it hadn't done any harm. Well, that was awfully good news. But she, and then one day when he was, she was quite a hand to play with him. One time she gave him a haircut. She cut every bit of his hair right off the front. She facing him. He was playing, and she took her little scissors and clipped his hair right to the bone. And I guess he clipped hers, too, if the truth was known. But anyway, she sure trimmed him up one time. And then another time, uh, oh, I can't remember. When she was, when he was learning to crawl, he'd crawl over the machine and take a hold of the knobs and try to climb up. And when he'd get a hold of it, he could, he could pull himself up so that he could kind of stand until he got scared and then he'd sit back down. And one time he climbed, she saw him doing that, and she said, Butter boy, butter boy, you better not touch that sheeny, Mama, thank you, little high aunt. I don't know whether one of her choice words nowadays is 16, her numbers, or not. Maybe if she thought back through the years, she could tell that 16 was quite a prominent number to her. But when she was little, everything was 16. It was 16 pound, or 16 love. And I'd say, how much do you love Mama? And she'd say, 16, 16. And when Uncle Gail came over there, he's sporting some of the girl, or not Uncle Gail, but Uncle D. He was going with some of the girls there in Tropic, and he'd come over and play with her a little bit. And he'd come over earlier for the dance or something. And he, they thought Olene was quite cute stuff. And, 
and they'd get her to talk for him, he and Ellen Cox. And they'd say, how much do you love me, Olini? And she'd say, 16 pound, 16 pound. And that'd really tickle him. Then one time she went over to the store for me and I told her, she's a little bigger now, and I told her, you go over and get a pound of cheese and a dozen eggs and tell them, clerk, put them in the sack so you can carry them good and then car carry the eggs. You're careful home and don't break them or hit them against anything. You know, I'd tell her, and she was your sure faithful little soul. She did the shopping. You just had to write it down, you know, on the count. Then we just drew and then paid. Don't trust people anymore, but they did then. Anyhow, she went over and she said, uh, my mama wants 16 cheese and a pound of eggs. And I guess that uh, as long as Charlie Winch lived, he never got over teasing Olene about wanting 16 cheese and a pound of eggs. She used to like to do cute things around home and help me, and I kind of took her in, uh, you know, to keep her amused and happy while well, I just play to her and talk with her all the time. I guess it was kept me amused and happy too, but for her hair, so she didn't press when I curled it, I'd have to curl it around my finger. It was naturally curly. And I'd just curl the ringlets around, you know, but sometimes little kids don't like to stand, stay still while you do, but I'd tell her that she's going to the beauty parlor and she's a big lady going to the beauty parlor and she'd go and have permanents and have beautician curl her hair and fix her and she just sits still and cute. She played beauty parlor with me for a year or two getting her hair done every Saturday in the curls for Sunday and she looked so cute as she'd go bobbing along and those curls bouncing and then she'd have a big bouquet of ribbon in them and uh, she was in little parks and things and it's, she'd go to primary all the time and uh, sometimes I'd send her just alone and she'd go and come back alone. Even when she's just in the nursery, she'd go. And Mabel Jolly was the chorister and she got so discouraged because the kids acted up and they wouldn't sing and they'd do this and that and she'd feel so bad. And one time she came down there when Olene was about two and a half or three. <clears throat> she had a little gift. It was a little card with some, a little bracelet and, and beads and a hair bow, bow of ribbon or something on it, and she said she brought this for Olene. She says she's the only one that'll sit there and try to learn the words and sing the songs, and she said, I've been going to give up my job a dozen times, and then I thought if just one little soul will listen and try to learn to sing and pay attention, I, she's been an inspiration for me to carry on, and she says I just brought this to her in, in appreciation for what she been to me, the inspiration she's been to me, because she said every time she just sits with her little arms folded and she'll sing the words and she'll just try so hard, and she said she just helped me to, I knew that if one little soul was trying to sing primary songs, it was worth my whole effort to come and teach, and I, it just made us cry, she cried and I cried, and, and uh, I guess Olene didn't realize what was going on, but anyhow, they brought her those little gifts. During this time, she had uh, chicken pox. She went to Sunday school and sat by some kids. I think it was Della Meekham's kids. Della uh, Bybee, after she was married, and they was bro broke out with chicken pox right by the side of her, I guess, <clears throat> because she broke out with chicken pox, and she was in the class with them, and they come over from Canab, and during the Sunday school, they broke out with chicken pox, and Olene must have been close enough to him to get an exposure because she broke out with chicken pox. And Gail got him from him, and he was just covered, and Gary had one solitary chicken pox, and it was about as big as a quarter. Olene had uh, not a lot, but they were big, and they left some scars on her. But they weren't too sick. I kept them in and was careful with them because I'd heard that chicken pox could be quite... Uh, treacherous, you know, if you didn't take good care of kids, that sometimes they had after effects if they, you know, took a setback or anything, so I was quite careful with them. But Gail was miserable with his chicken pox. They just covered all over him. Being there alone with her when she's quite little, I taught her nearly all the nursery rhymes and some cute little readings and things, and she was a darling little girl. 
she could just do a lot of cute things. I just wish that she could look back on her childhood. I know she can't remember a lot of the things that she did, but but uh, she uh, was an attractive child. One time when she was little, I was letting her go in and get the milk for Gail's uh, bottle. I was giving him canned milk, and it was the morning's milk was the ones I was giving him. But <clears throat> just the regular was a big old picture of a cow with horns, a longhorn cow. But the one that they had for the babies that had vitamins in was a picture of a baby on it. And that was the kind I was having in his bottle for when I supplemented his feedings. And uh, I'd let him, her go into a box in the back room and bring me out a new can when I needed it. And she went in, she got it. And, but one time when I went over to get a case, Charlie said, I don't have, Charlie went, she said, I don't have a full case. I'll make it up to you with just the regular, if that's what you want, and then bring it over. And so he did. But when we got kind of down to where she got that, she was always bringing it and looking at this little baby each time and making over the baby on the can of milk and bringing it for Badu Boy, you know. And, so one time she said, oh, oh, Badu boy. She got this one with the longhorn cow. She said, oh, oh, Badu boy, I bring you out a can of bull's milk. We was quite proud when Olene was quite little because Herman was uh, connected some way with the National Geographic magazine and the photographers and that. And, and they came and took a picture of Olene holding the big round ammonite, and that was put in one of the National Geographic magazines. And we were quite pleased with that. I used to make all of Olene's clothes, and I made her the nicest clothes, and I could make them for about 20 cents a dress in those days. You could get a yard of cloth for 15, 14, 17, 19, and your very best was about 20 or 25, 28 cents a yard. And then you'd get the little findings and put with that. And so I just had oodles of little dresses. Sometimes I'd put two or three on her de a day just to get to change her clothes. And the summer for the Gail was born while I was expecting. The summer for Gail was born while I was expecting him. Olene was up on the homestead with us. It was her second summer up there. And she would walk all the way from the cabin, the homestead house, up to uh, the crail up on the homestead that the Shakespeare's used to have years ago where we milked a cow, one of dad's cows, a whole uh, good cow, and made butter for both us and grandpa's and grandma Pollock's family. And uh, each night and morning, Herman would milk the cow, and at night he would let Olene and I walk up with him. And she was so independent that she'd walk practically every step of the way, and most of the way she was a little bit ahead of us. And she'd just go tritting along up that trail. And we had a cat up on the homestead with us because there was lots of mice. And. Uh, that cat used to play with Olene. It had run ahead of her and hide behind a sagebrush. And then when she came along, it would jump out on, on her. It would almost make her cry. She liked it, but it almost frightened her. It would jump right up on her with its paws and kind of attack her. I don't think it really meant to hurt her. It was more playful. But one time, Herman brought a gopher that he killed, or he somehow, and she saw the cat eat that gopher. Well. I guess it was just a mystery to her because it really, and she says she can still remember that. And I guess maybe she can. It must have made quite an impression on her. I know the first year up there, we had a little baby picture of Herman sitting on the first step of the cabin with uh, Olene sitting on his lap, on his knees. She would have been, uh, let's see, she would have been past a year. She'd have been a year in November and it had been that next summer. And uh, she had this little ribbon on the top of her head. It looks kind of cute. And she was really sick that one time. She got some kind of a virus and got uh, 
dis got um, diarrhea, and oh, I just thought I never save her. I took about 30 diapers off of her just from mid afternoon until evening. Then we came down to the Tropic and we went to the um, PWA camp and got medication from the doctor there. He gave us paragoric for her and we started giving her paragoric and she came out of it but all we were frightened we we left up the homestead and came down to tropic because we got so frightened herman walked over and called at the y and herman and herman's dad came up and got us and brought us down and she was really sick it just about done her up it was a good thing we got down off that mountain and got some help for because we didn't have any medication up there and another time, she was just playing on the floor. I was laying on the bed. I was quite pregnant with Je with Gail and kind of resting and letting her play with her toys right down there in the front of the bed. But Herman brought a pair of boots that he'd been uh, working in, and I guess there'd been some kind of mud cling up in the heels of them or something, track off the floor. And in that, there'd been a little rock that I didn't know was in there, and I didn't know she had that. She was just playing with her toys, and all of a sudden she started acting funny, and I looked down, and she was acting kind of funny, and I don't know what ever made me think it, because I didn't know there was anything in her mouth, but my first impulse was to pick her up and tip her upside down and pat her on the back. She was just passing out, you know, going dark in her face, and and I, I knew she didn't have anything big enough in her toys to be choking on, but I tipped her up and hit her on the back and a big piece of gravel rock came out of her throat and that scared me so we had a few little scares after she got over being sick from her baby trauma but she was quite a healthy little girl and and she brought lots of joy in our lives i'd walk up and get the mail and carry gail and she'd always go a little ways ahead and peek through all the fences to see the calves and the lambs and everything. I remember a cute little red coat she had. I had taught her to say Jolly Old St. Nicholas, or sing the little song Jolly Old St. Nicholas, and she kind of liked that, and then she'd heard the name Hen Jolly, our neighbor. And so whenever she'd see him, she called him St. Jolly. She got the two mixed up and she just, for years, why well, he was always St. Jolly to her. And that, that pleased him. He just grinned all over to think he was St. Jolly. And uh, she just did a lot of cute things if I could remember them all. One time she was over to the store and she was down by the counter and Nida was looking at some canned stuff there and she went to set a can of soup or tomatoes or something down on the counter and she didn't get it quite far on enough and it fell off and Olene was looking at and it hit her right in the mouth all oh, that bled it cut her teeth I think she might still have a little scar there it just laid her lip open and we felt so bad about that her little mouth swelled up and she was just a little thing looking up you know seeing what was going on and just right under where Nida was I'd have felt bad to think she did that. And then one time when she was sick and we tried to give her some aspirin, she wouldn't take it from me. She just shut her teeth and mouth and would not take it. But if uh, Nida tried to give it to her, she just gobble it down. I don't know why she didn't particularly like Nida, but she'd take aspirin. <laughs> she took aspirin from her, but she fought it every time I tried to give it to her. And uh, let's see, there was another thing or two. One time, uh, Herman came in and threw a little sack of candy, hardtack candy. That's about all we ever did get. And it'd just be a little five cent bag of hardtack candy that he might have got at the store and twisted shut. And he threw it in the door and said, I'm going out the lane with uh, Frank Hallstrom and see some fossils or rocks or something. And, he threw that in and says, here, this is for Olene, the kids. Give the kids some of this or something. You know, I knew he, I'd have to break it up for Gail. Gail was quite little. And I had Olene in the bathtub. And he just threw it in and it lit on a chair. 
and I was facing Olean, and Gail creeped over to that chair, and unbeknownst to me, he got that sack and got it open. And we, he came in there just uh, acting so funny, he tried to swallow whole everything that we, he got. Instead of trying to suck it or anything, he didn't know he'd get it in his mouth, and then he'd try to swallow it, and then he'd choke. And he was just choking, and I, I knew he had a piece of that candy in his mouth because he, he had, the sack was open there, and I knew that was what was wrong. He was choking on that, and I put my, I tipped him up, and nothing would come out. I pounded him on the back, and I didn't know how to do that uh, Heiner, 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 Heinerman, or whatever it is, uh, thing, you know, where you put your hands over the chest and then pull up. But I, I knew that if you tipped them up and give them a chug right down between the shoulder blades and had their head down, it was apt to pop out if it was something that was loose in their throat. And it wouldn't come out, so I put my finger down in there and I could feel a piece of hard tack over his windpipe and he was just going black, going, uh, 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 and just a struggling. And oh, I was scared. I yelled to Nida, oh, Nida, my baby's choking to death, choking to death. And she heard me and she started to run. She could hear me from my kitchen door to hers. And she started to run over there and we met right out. I was taking him. I don't know, you always run for somebody when you have trouble. And she was the closest person I could think of. And so we ran and I said, he's got a piece of candy lodged in his throat. I can feel it, but I can't get it. And she says, let me take him. And she reached down in there and she says, I can feel it too. Her finger was longer and she could, I said, I can just barely tick it, but I couldn't get it out. And she, her finger was longer and she pushed down in there and pushed it on down. She says it went on down. And then that went on down into his little stomach, I guess. And, and uh, it was closing off his windpipe and then he just laid stupid all afternoon, all the rest of the afternoon sweat just ran off of him. He just acted sick, but, and I think it kind of grazed his throat. He wouldn't uh, take his bottle or anything very good, you know, his food or swallow very good for quite a little while. I think it kind of scratched his throat the way we was digging at it, trying to get that candy out. We knew it wouldn't dissolve before he'd die, but poor Oline, she just sat in that bathtub without anybody to bathe her or anything. Well, we got back over there. She was just scared to death. Was Buddy Boy going to die? Was Buddy, was Buddy Boy going to die? And we said no, and she was just purple. You know, she'd got so cold sitting in that bathtub all wet, and the doors open, and it was in the spring of the year, and <laughs> it was really quite an episode. But Gail was the darnest kid to choke. One time when uh, we walked up with him, and he was just a little baby. I don't think it was more than four or five months old, three or four months old. I walked up with him in my arms and Olene came along beside me and we went up to Mother's. We got the mail and went up, I think I went up and helped her quilt part of the afternoon or something. When we went to come back, my mother said, Irma, you carried the baby down for Zorabelle. And oh, she was just delighted. She was just a kid, maybe eight or 10 and uh, maybe a little older than that, I don't know, 12, maybe 12, 11. I don't know how old, she didn't have good sense, I know, <laughs> that age. But she went down to the store, she had some money, and she got ahead of us with the baby. I said I had to stop in and get some groceries or something at the store. I had to get something for the kids, one of them some pavlum or milk or something at the store, some little item. And I stopped in the store and she, and I think I gave her the money and she bought some of these packages, they used to call them horse, horse money or something. It's kind of like five cent pieces, all flat candies along, you know, cheapest candy you can buy. And she bought a, a roll of that and took on down the street with him. And I said, I'll be going to lean and come in just a second as soon as Luelle gives me this. And she started down the street with him and she got about a block and then she started back. And I met her, and she said, something's wrong with your baby, Zorabelle. And I said, something's wrong with him. It wasn't. And I said, you didn't drop him, did you? And she said, no. And I said, well, what can be wrong? And she says, I don't know. And I looked, and he's just going black and choking. And I said, oh, my word, he's got something in his throat. I said, did he spit up? And she said, no. 
I thought maybe he spit up milk and then strangled on it, you know. And she said, no, he didn't spit up. And I said, you didn't put any, you didn't let him get anything in his mouth, did you? And she said, well, I gave him a piece of that candy. And my word, he'd try to swallow that and it had caught in his throat. Well, we were about down the street, about as far, about two blocks down the street from the Wells store to Harry Baugh's house. And I was screaming, my baby's choking to death. Oh, my baby's choking to death. I tipped him up, I did everything. You know, he's just a little baby in shawls. And uh, Harry Baugh came out and he got him and he tipped him up. He got his finger in his mouth some way and he got it out of his throat. Well, Gail survived that. It's a wonder that kid, <laughs> there's about four times that he choked just really hard on candy. Got a, a chunk of heart attack in his throat. And then when he was uh, learning to crawl and they were eating pine nuts, in the springtime, you know, they, they got him in the fall, and it was that next spring, he was learning to call, he was born in September, and by spring, he was crawling a little and getting around, scooting around on the floor. And if he could see a pine of shell or a little feather, the least little chip, he would scoot from one end of that room to the other, just, just work diligently to get there, and the minute he got it, he'd put it in his mouth. I've never seen a baby that wanted to put anything in his mouth so much as if I had other babies that never offered to put a thing in their mouth. But he would go a mile for the least little thing he could see on the floor and put it in his mouth. So he was quite a character that way. But oh, he was a good natured baby. He just didn't cry or fret. And he was such a good, good baby to take care of. But the only thing, Eileen was such an attractive little girl and Gail being a little boy and then I think him being uh, pulled on and hurt so bad when he was born, you know, it was such a hard birth and he had to be, he was breached and he had to be turned and brought feet first and everything. I, and it pulled his little head right over to one side. He didn't hold his neck up for quite a long while. And I think that kind of bothered him a little bit because at first he lost his baby hair all around the outside. He had quite a bit of hair and it was quite dark. And he had these dark eyes, cute baby. And uh, he had uh, a sweet little face and dainty features and kind of an olive skin. He wasn't a heavy, fat, chubby baby. He was a more of a slender baby. But anyway, he... Uh, I guess on his rubbing from side to side on his little crib and pillow turning, he lost all of his baby hair right around the edges and he had just like a little toupee on top of his little black toupee. And he just looked so funny. He looked like a little cock robin or something with a little hoodie on. And all the sides was bare. He lost his long baby hair. And then that started to come back in and the top went off. And then he looked like a little old bald headed man with a ball head on top and, and hair coming all around the side. It took Gail quite a while to get uh, really looking right cute with his hair. You know, with his hair, he looked all right with a hat on or a hoodie, but that was when they came and wanted to take the picture of Olene and, and Gail, and I wouldn't let them. I said, no, I'm not letting you take a picture of the baby. His hair's all rubbed off and it doesn't look good, and, and he would never be happy over his baby picture. I said he's been so cute before his hair came out and I think it was just that he had a hard birth and it was hard on him and it made his hair fall. When uh, I got home with Gail, Lemoyne wanted to come and see him real bad but mother wouldn't let him come down for a while and so it was quite a while, it was several days before he got to come down and see him. He waited till one morning he walked down with mother. She brought some milk down. Each morning she'd send some new milk down for Olene. And she walked down and brought Lemoyne with her. I guess he's about five, four or five. I don't know how old he was, but let's see. He was nine months old when we was married. Olene was four. He 
be about between five and six, maybe six. Anyhow, he came and stood in there, watched me bathe him. I was just bathing him and had him uh, stripped naked when they come in, and mother came on in with him where I was bathing Gail by the stove, the little heater. And Lloyd, he's all big-eyed. He looked at him naked there, and he said, Oh, for little of a bugger. I'll never forget the first thing Moyne said about Gail when he's a baby. I, I didn't know whether I liked that or not. Instead of saying, oh, he's darling, isn't he cute? You know, the girls came down and made over him. Oh, can we hold him? And, but Moyne just stood off, put his hands in his pocket and kind of squinched up his nose and said, oh, for little of a bugger. <laughs> Dad Pollock wouldn't hardly look at him. Mother said, go over to the basket and see the baby dad go over and see him. that was after we got him home he didn't like it very well because we had to go in the night I should tell you more about Gail's birth he, it, it was time for him to be born and I think it was Dr. Monet that I had engaged Dr. Biglow had stopped practicing now and a young doctor Dr. Monet I think was the one and then later than that, Dr. Heyman came. But I believe it was Dr. Monet, the way I remember. And he came to our house in the lane. And he worked all that night and nearly all the next day. And the next night, he decided that he was going to have to take me in the middle of the night to the hospital in Richfield. And so we went to the hospital in Richfield. And it was really an ordeal to get Gail. It was a long, drawn-out time. And poor Gail was scratched with instruments and couldn't be brought that way. And so he had to be turned and, and brought feet first. And it pulled his little neck so much that his little head kind of laid over on his shoulder for quite a while. But one of the doctors down there that was assisting said, oh, if I ever saw a perfect shaped head on a baby, it was Gail's. He just couldn't say enough for how he, he thought that Gail had the most perfect shaped head for a baby of any baby he thought ever delivered. He said, boy, I'll tell you, he's gonna have some brains. He says, he's really got a good shaped head to be a smart man. I don't know whether he's just chirping me up or whether he had something that he was going by, but I think Gail's a pretty smart guy, too. Anyhow, while I was there, the doctor said, what have you got here? And I had this mole on my eye, and uh, he said that he would take it off while I was under the anesthetic, but he didn't. So before we came home, he took me in and took a, a hot needle, you know, electric needle, and burnt that. Well, he froze it first, and what after that the freezing came out he he said it just came out like a little round ball and after the freezing came out along two or three hours after that it was just like all night long like somebody held a red hot poker on my on that spot just above my eye i suffered that whole night through and gail was quite a good baby to nurse he nursed pretty good for having such a hard time getting here and he didn't seem to give me too much trouble but after I got home he was kind of uh, colicky for a while of course I kind of worried over him and that might have brought part of it on you know and but he did pretty good but you know it cost quite a lot he, he uh, Dr. Monet couldn't bring him and so he had to have Dr. Lowe was the one that assisted and finally brought the baby brought him and so Dr. Lowe was really his physician that brought Gail. I think he's on Gail's birth certificate as the one that delivered him. And uh, quite a while after that, Olene and Gail, when they were a little bit bigger, not very big, I don't think Gail really was old enough to get the significance of it, but Olene said to him, Butter boy, I'm better than you. He says, she, she said, just Dr. Low brought you, Dr. Big Low brought me. So we always laughed about that because of the doctors that brought the two kids. 
but it cost about $150 to bring Gail, and it had usually cost Dad and Mother about 10 or $15 to, for, the, for the delivery of one of their babies because they just had a midwife. I think Mother said she didn't have a, a physician with any of her babies, but she got her babies real easy. And so Dad said to Mother, well, Mother, Herman and Zorbel just raise a, about $115 better babies than you and I did. I don't think he liked it too well because he had to shell out that much money because Herman was working for him. But poor old Herman laid out to the herd about that many days because he was getting a dollar a day wages to pay for Gail. So we Gail, you was worth a lot to us. Herman worked pretty hard to pay off your doctor bill. <laughs> I don't, but then that happened to most all of our kids. We didn't get any of them too cheap. Then it started to be that we had to have hospitals and pay for hospitalization and everything, and and we couldn't just have a midwife come in like Mother and Pollock did, Mother Pollock and them did. But uh, it came along to where you got big enough to have. Um, take it out a little bit and it seemed like I must have kept you pretty close at home because it seemed like you got earache quite easy whenever I'd take you out. I kind of hated to take you out much because you'd get earache and and I remember he caught, cried quite a little bit with colic when I first brought him home. I guess it was because I was worrying quite a bit about him and he nursed that. But he had quite a good appetite. He wasn't a very vivacious nurser in fact, he just kind of nibbled to the side of Olean. She nursed a lot better than Gail, although she was a naughty little puddin'. When anybody was there, you couldn't force her head to the breast. But when I was there alone with her, she would just eat just as normal as could be. When I went visiting with her, I had to go in another room and shut the door to feed her the breast because she would not take it in front of anybody else. She was that modest. Maybe she knew that I was embarrassed to nurse in front of other people but she sure helped me out a lot because she wouldn't take her dinner in front of anybody else. And I was quite strict in giving her her feedings right on the time, so no matter where I was, I either had to find an extra room or somewhere to, to feed her. But Gail, he didn't care who was there. He ate his dinner, but he just was gentle about it. And uh, he didn't seem to thrive too good at first. For quite a while there. When he was four or five months old, he didn't seem to be gaining much. In those days, we used to nurse our babies till they was almost a year. That's what the doctors would have us do. In fact, the doctor told me not to wean Olene until she's 13 months old. But they have you wean them three, four, five months now. But we had baby food by the time Gail came along and Pablum. So he had, and they had orange juice for him, and they always got their cod liver oil. So whenever they burped, their little clothes smelled like cod liver oil all day, and that's why we had little burp bibs on them all the time. I made quite a lot of little bibs. So whenever I used to feed Gail after I got so I'd feed him with a spoon, I'd always say to him when he's little, let's put your bib on. And so whenever I'd hold up a bib and say, oh, what's this, Gail? When he got big enough to talk a little bit, he'd call it his bib on. It never was a bib, it was a bib on. And another thing, he liked eggs, soft boiled eggs, uh, the yolk of soft boiled eggs I would give him, and he liked them pretty good. And I'd hold him there at the table and feed him and try to get, if he squirmed in that, I'd say, come on, hurry, let's eat your egg up. And so soft boiled eggs was egg ups to Gail. He never ever called them an egg. I'd say, what's this? And he'd say, it's an egg up when he could talk a little bit. Well, he'd eat about a drum of pablin a week, so you know he ate a lot of pablin. I could give him lots of pablin and canned milk, and he grew pretty good on that. But Nida, she just bugged me all the time that he wasn't getting enough on the breast, on the breast. I ought to subsidize his food, and so finally I put him on some canned milk. Well, at first, he wouldn't take it. He just bowled up and would not take the, ca the bottle. So I struggled and struggled, and then all at once he decided, yes, he'd take that hard rubber nipple. 
But then I couldn't get him to take a bit of breast. I was going to just feed him part breast and part a uh, bottle. And when he finally took the bottle, and he wouldn't have a thing to do with the breast. So that's how I, I weaned him. He was quite easy to wean, but I really weaned him before I wanted to, about five or six months. But he did pretty good on the other food. And, but one time I, did, I looked, and his little legs was growing long, but they was kind of spindly, and I didn't have money or anything to buy him orange juice and cod liver oil and the things I thought he needed right then, and Herm was out the herd. And, and uh, Elva came over, and I was crying. I was bathing him. I looked at him, and I thought, he's too skinny. He's not fat. He's not as fat. Ollie he was such a chubby baby, and I was kind of crying. I thought, maybe if I had orange juice, or maybe if I had some of these things, and we was both just as poor as church mice. I remember when about that time that I wouldn't even have a, a penny, not a penny. We could go to the store and just charge a few things, and then Herman had, Dad would pay the accounts and, and take it out of Herman's wages and out of Island's wages, you know when he settled up, but we tried to be as careful as we could, or at least I did. And I just says, I'm not going to be careful. My husband's working, and he's paying for this. I'm going to have what I want, but I would never do that, and I would never go ask Dad for money, but I did make out a martyr to Sears and go up and tell him how much he wanted, and he'd give it, and then finally he decided they couldn't live on the same amount that Herman and I was living on, so he raised their wages, and that made Mother mad. She told her dad, she said, just because Zorabel save and not as a spendthrift, why then you raise Island's wages. She says, I'm not going to stand for that. And she just had a spell over that. There's just some things that she didn't like, and she said it about it. I didn't ever say a thing. In all the years Herman worked for dad, I never once asked him for